So then we, we made it to Bombay, got off, spent a week or ten days in Bombay, put us up at a hotel. Then they wanted us to go to Calcutta. Uh, Calcutta's on the other side of India. So they put us on the Calcutta Mail Express. Took out know, ten days or something like that. It was an old wooden burning train. Every hundred miles or so they would stop and they had chop wood along the side and they would load the train up with wood. And also there was a place to get water and they would go into these little towns and there was a big tank of water which they would then fill up the, their tank with it. So then we have wood and then water and then generate the steam and run the engine. These cars were not very comfortable. All the seats were made of made out of bamboo or something like that, but I mean those slats. And uh, of course we all had sleeping bags, so we had to use a sleeping bag to sleep on this, these stupid things. On this chugging on chugging on chugging on chugging on. Nothing to do but sit there all day long, look out the windows, although there were no windows, and, and spaces in the gaps. Finally end up in Calcutta. In the middle of Calcutta, there was a big park. And in this park is where the British put all the facilities for his soldiers. Because see, there was no fighting in India. It was a rest and recreation center. The fighting theoretically was in Burma. So to keep us busy, and since we were so that's with our job, so they gave us ambulances. So I drove all through Calcutta. Two ambulances. One was a Jeep ambulance. Now, they mostly were in, in Burma. The other type was also in Burma. It was the Dodge ambulance. And I still see some of those around. Uh, we also would help the doctors in the exam rooms and so forth. We were just kind of a little bit like an orderly, so to speak. So then they decided to invade Burma. So they sent us up to a town north of Calcutta. There's an airport, big airport. They put us on an airplane, a DC-3 or the C-47. And there must have been hundreds of aircraft here. And so then, boats all over the place too. So we're on this plane, and I can look out the window and I can see these hundreds of boats, all getting ready to invade Rangoon. And so we all, we go there and we invade Rangoon. There's only one small problem. The Japanese had better intelligence than we did. They had already left, not three days earlier. So I asked him to come in Rangoon and went in by there. All the Japanese had gone. They sent us, from, after a couple of weeks from Rangoon, they sent us up to a little town called Pegu, which is about between 90 and 100 miles north of, north of uh, Bombay. And there we spent several months essentially keeping the Japanese from crossing this area of where they could get over to the other side. We had one artillery piece and they had one artillery piece. And neither one of us had a great deal of ammunition. So they would fire maybe one or two shots in the morning, cannon aimed roughly in the direction of us, and we would fire one or two cannon shots the afternoon, roughly in the same area where we thought the Japanese were. Nobody ever seemed to get hurt. It almost, almost well, got to be kind of funny. Well, it's our time to shoot now. So after oh, two or three months of that, came back to Rangoon and got on a ferry boat and went from Rangoon to uh, Karachi. And there was a bunch, like several hundred 18-wheelers there, big, great, big things. And they didn't have enough drivers to. They wanted to go to Hyderabad. So there's 30, 40, 50 years field service people. So they asked if we would drive these monsters. Did you know how to drive a, uh, hmm? did you know how to drive an 18 wheeler? Yeah. Nothing like that. None of us did. We were kids. So we get put in this thing. Oh, it was a mess because there was one of these, what they call cab over engine, where the, where the cab, when the engine sat right here, right next to you, 
in the room right here. And it was noisy and loud and hot. spit oil and hot. And so we, we drove these 18 wheelers about, I don't know, 1,500 miles in convoy, about two feet behind the, and in front of each truck. And something like that. 16 gears forward. You had to shift all the time, and it had all. It didn't have synchronous uh, gear shifting. You had to double clutch it. Every time you, we had to go through, every time you got started, you had to go through 16 gears. You had to double clutch every one of them. So all you're doing all day long is pumping that damn clutch pedal and moving the thing back. Well, we got there. Every night we would stop some field. They already sent people out and they dug the trains for it. Then we'd spend the night, take off the next day, and we finally ended up in Secunderabad. So I spent a month or so in Secunderabad. And the state of Hyderabad, neither of Hyderabad, which was the chief, the boss, but at that time we said the richest man in the world. So the story goes, tons and tons of, of jewels collected over the years. In fact, they claim, I don't know how true it is, they claim that he had a Rolls Royce stashed in a garage completely loaded with jewels in case there was ever a resurrection. He could jump the Rolls Royce and take off all his jewels and still be the wealthiest man around. Nizam of Hyderabad had invited European to come to visit. And he's trying to clean it up like China trying to clean up Beijing. But he was in a hurry. So, so what he had done, there was a major, a major highway road going from the railway station to this castle. So you go down this wide eight or ten lane highway and you looked at all of these rather new looking buildings on either side. But if you weren't in any of these buildings, there's nothing there, there's facades. He had this whole thing, this made it look like a facade. Oh, I hate the way they do this. So when these people came, they would be put on the automobiles, driven down the highway, they would see these. And well, finally, we had to go home. Uh -huh. Threw us up to Karachi, and I developed a Not here, by the way. Yeah. So right. I had to stay behind. Maybe 30 few of us people. So they went, you. they left. And I stayed behind in Karachi for four or five days, so my his heels some. So then they put me on a C-47, the old DC-3, and they flew me to Tel Aviv. My ears started acting up again, and, and I was having a wonderful time in Tel Aviv. I was in Tel Aviv for about over three weeks. Uh, I was having so much fun, I, I didn't want to leave. You know, finally, I ran out of money, so then I had to leave. So I spent about three weeks in Tel Aviv, just having a ball, going everything, and learning about the Bible and so forth. Then they put me on a plane. B-24, I think it was, and flew me to, flew us to Germany and spent the night in Germany, some town, I don't know, there's an airport, and then to London. And then we spent a few days in London. They shipped us down to Wales, spent a couple of weeks in Wales. After about 18 months, the war was over. It coincided with the time I was supposed to leave. I, you could you could say longer if you wanted to. Yes, under the contract. And uh, but 18 months and the end of the war coincided pretty closely. So by this time they they, they sent me home.